to warm up, let's get started with an easy <laughs> and general question. What are the main challenges that democracies has to face today? Who wants to start? Well, yes, yeah. I do. Now, I apologize for my voice because I uh, lost my voice, but if I speak in like this into the microphone, I hope you can hear me. I think there are two big challenges that have come together for democracy today. The first is absolutely fundamental, that people are losing faith in it as a system. By that I mean that a lot of non-elite and ordinary people are ceasing to believe that they can find a way through democratic institutions of rectifying the things that are wrong or somehow uh, uh, finding a, a, a pattern of life that will suit them and that they can actually get it through. At the same time, deep divisions are appearing in democratic societies of a kind which really oughtn't to be relevant to differences of uh, ethnic background, differences of origin, differences of religion are now being very sharply marked and with hostility across these boundaries. So these two things, if you like, the demos at one and the same time feels that it's powerless and it's also being deeply divided by a terrible cleavage. I would add that we have we're the first generations who know about the man-made climate change. And secondly, we are faced with um, dramatic uh, technological developments. Um, think of digitalization, artificial intelligence, but also synthetic biology, uh, which will change and alter humankind and our way of life. So if we're not come across or come to terms with what Charles just said about fixing democracy, and we're not able to shape our own destiny, we'll be overruled by these two developments, climate change and technological development. The answer was fantastic and interesting. So let's move on on the same line. Democracy is something we're used to, very much like the air that we breathe um, and we don't even see. However, just as the air that we breathe right now, warnings are coming from all different corners, repeating that democracy is undergoing a deep crisis. Patricia Nance, how are, are our democracies in a state of crisis? Is democracies, democracy in danger? I would say that, of course, it is in danger. The question is how deep those crises are. Is it only a question of um, you know, abstinence or disaffection? Is it only a question of whether people um, don't have respect anymore on certain governments or certain politicians? Or is it deeper and sort of addressing the backbone of democracy? namely the fact that um, the loyalty or faith of democratic system, the democratic system or democracy as a way of life is, is in danger. And I believe that the second is the case now. So it's, it's deeper than we thought, probably. And um, so there are many surveys uh, in the last uh, 10 years around. Uh, they're, they differ quite a lot, but you can see that in the last 20 years, the people in Western democracies, not only US, but also European countries, who say that democracy is um, not a very good or very bad way of governing their own country, rise um, quite um, remarkably. And what is even more um, frightening is that younger people um, are saying that much more than older people. So the ones who will you know, stay longer on this planet. So I, I do believe that um, so, sort of autocratic and also technocratic ways of ruling a country is more accepted now by younger people than it used to be. And this is, I think, is a, a very um, frightening uh, state of, of democracy we're in right now. So if the crisis is not just a matter of dissatisfaction, but it goes m more deeply into the structures of our society and the structure of democracy, um, how can we understand what is actually happening to our democracy. I was just looking around and there are different ways of interpreting at the structural level what is happening, right? Uh, on the one hand, uh, the champions of neoliberalism would say that it is the market and the free market that is um, the way of saving democracy from uh, too strong interventions by the state which would open up um, the path towards totalitarianism. On the other hand, uh, other thinkers such as, for example, the uh, US American political theorist Wendy Brown would say just the opposite, would say that neoliberalism 
heavily jeopardizes the very foundations of democracy. Let me just share with you a quote, and then we can move from there, talking more deeply about, about that, because I think she brings it to the point. She writes, more than merely saturating the meaning of content of democracy with market values, neoliberalism assaults the principles, practices, cultures, subjects, and institutions of democracy understood as the rule of the, peop of the people. So following her, she says that in place of what is the homo politicus, the citizen which is concerned with the public good, the new figure of our times is not only the homo economicus, the economic man, but more specifically, the economic man as entrepreneur of herself or of himself. Um, who follows the logic and, and, and enhances and implements the logic of competition, entrepreneurial risk and investment in all areas of society. So this is one possible analysis. Um, just say, Laura, do you think this is an adequate analysis of what is happening? What other entry points do we need to understand why democracy is in a crisis? How and why did this crisis come about? A lot of people who are in this kind of situation and others who are suddenly their way of life is, is just disappearing on them, they would like to believe that the democracy gives them possible leverage, some kind of program they can go through, and they find the system in two ways. They find it very resistant to them. Somehow they can't bring about these changes. And they also find it very opaque. Who's pulling the strings? As a matter of fact, there is, of course, in this kind of situation, an immense power of money, particularly in the United States, right, which uh, blocks a lot of public, uh, popular initiatives at every turn. So it's both a sense that we can't make the system work for us, and it's very opaque and not transparent. I mean, so all the figures that Patricia was citing earlier, that people say, young people, democracy doesn't work, that's the human experience behind that. And that is catastrophic for us. Theories make this distinction between the output legitimation and the input legitimation of democracy, where the input legitimation, the way I understood it, is really about the, the, the role of the citizen. Citizens identifying with the idea of democracy in its normative meaning, right, as addressing uh, the public sphere, the public good. Um, and whereas the output legitimation is attached to the promise of well-being that goes together with democracy. So to some extent, our democracies for years have been, uh, have been able to promise a, a constant increase in well-being because they were linked to the image of economic growth. So, and this is a question probably for both of you and then we can from there move on to, to more political dimensions. But um, so is there... Have we reached a point in which that kind of link is no longer working and therefore the outbound legitimation is, uh, so in other words, the American dream is no longer working. I don't know whether it has ever worked. For sure it hasn't worked for everyone. But that kind of narrative um, is kind of broken right now. So, so the crisis, would you say is the crisis in both, in both in both uh, respect, in the term of the output and on the input legitimation of democracy, or um, is that a good way of framing this discussion? What do you think? And I would like to hear from both of you. I think what got Im impoverished is the democratic life. You know, democracy is a way of life. And this is what we, we see now, that for, for many years and decades, I think there was an impoverishment of questions of political community, of identity, which has been sort of forgotten in political discourse and which comes up now again in, as a backlash through populism as we see it. And so I believe that the preconditions of democracy are, are drained and impoverished. Uh, so um, there is a, um, a dilemma called the Birkenfarmer dilemma uh, which says that the, the democratic states um, has to, um, cannot guarantee its own prerequisites, uh, which are not only the moral um, conditions of individuals, but also questions of democratic bonds between the people, questions of a common political culture, of political community, which are the ground, the common ground then to make, um, to have conflicts of interests or conflicts of values. And if this is impoverished, this of, of course, affects the democratic state, which cannot guarantee this. It sort of presupposes this sort of 
societal, how can I say, grounding of democracy. And I think this is what is in danger today. And it's very difficult to rebuild these preconditions, which has been impoverished so far. My name is Ariana. I'm also from the ISS. And I have a question. You, you spoke about that in the moment there is a lack of political leadership. And I was wondering, this ties a little bit back into what Ina said, but also I think what has been, has been said by Barbara and um, Charles Taylor and Patricia Nantz about um, the issue of neoliberal neoliberalism. So basically my question is this. Do you think the lack of political leadership also relates to the fact that we have, uh, as part of neoliberal politics, deregulated, liberalized a lot of sectors. So by now, they, the decisions have been given to market actors, to private sector actors, and they are not anymore in the political realm currently. And, um, you know, so currently if we speak, we see a lot of entrepreneurship leadership, but then it's like social entrepreneurs in the economic sector, but I, um, and less on the political, because if you, if you sometimes go deeper into some issues, you see that it's out of the hand of politics, basically. So it would, that was my question, because I, yeah, from where I come from, scientifically, that, that's a key problem there. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. There was a, a very misplaced confidence that the market can solve all these issues of distribution and welfare, welfare in the proper uh, I mean, well, not welfare and payment, but I mean the well-being. And this was, this always has seemed to me to be a misplaced confidence. But we, uh, the history has yet to be written of how, uh, you know, the, now the 1970s, there was a move in this direction among intellectuals, among certain think tanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Hayek became the Mont Pelerin Society and Hayek became very important and were, it's, uh, it's a little bit mysterious to me why it happened because I don't see any evidence at all. I mean, I think that there are two absurd theories uh, abroad. One is the Bolshevik one, that everything must be done by the state, and the other is neoliberalism, that everything must be done by the market. And the real world seems to be one where you have to pick your way between these. And the, as wise a way as possible, but somehow this madness seized us and it's time we got rid of it. Yeah, perhaps it's deeper than only that, that the market uh, sort of take, took over the, it's also a question of logic. So it's even within the persons, some of this sort of economical um, logic of competition gets over, often uh, takes over the own orientation for action, which is sort of in the South, not only in the question of, of uh, the market regulating uh, different areas and sectors. So I think it's also a question of the self being sort of economized and so it goes deeper.